Um, my name is Tom Kresh. I'm the Director of Graduate Admissions um, at Commonwealth U Lock Haven. So I really appreciate everybody joining us. I um, know there's a lot of other things you could be doing on a Thursday night um, in November. So again, we appreciate you taking time or giving up that free time to spend it with us. We do have a great event tonight. Um, this is our virtual information session for the Master's in Physician's Assistant Program. Um, I am joined by Dr. Grenoble and Dr. O'Brien. Um, would you guys mind introducing yourselves before we get started? Sure, go ahead, Curtis. All right, very good. Thanks, Amber. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, so my name is Curtis Grenoble. I am a faculty member with the uh, the, the PA program. Um, I am originally from central Pennsylvania. I grew up in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, went to, to Penn State with a degree in biology, and then uh, went to PA school at Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. I have some clinical background in uh, general surgery and surgical oncology at Geisinger Medical Center, and then orthopedic surgery in Dubois, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> joined the faculty at uh, Lock Haven University uh, in 2008. Um, so I'm in my 15th year um, as a faculty member uh, in the PA program, and I work out of the Clearfield campus uh, location, uh, currently uh, department chair uh, for the uh, Department of Physician Assistant Studies. And uh, Curtis, do you have any, any specific areas of, of research, anything that, that um, you know, you have a particular area of interest in? Uh, so I've uh, been able to do um, some presentations at national conferences on um, classroom technology uh, because the PA program, given that we're spread across multiple campus locations, we we heavily utilize uh, various forms of, uh, of of classroom technology uh, in order to uh, to deliver the program and to to deliver that across multiple campuses. So I've uh, had the opportunity uh, to to present on that topic um, in a few occasions. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Hi, everybody. My name is Amber O'Brien. I um, actually uh, started my career as a registered nurse, worked for a couple of years before going to Lock Haven University's PA program. I graduated in 2008, so the year Curtis started. Um, and I've worked in a variety of areas in medicine and surgery since graduation. I um, joined the faculty here in 2015, so I've been on faculty here now seven, almost eight years. Um, I am the chair of admissions for the program. I've been the chair of admissions for the last four years. Um, as far as research goes, so I'm gonna be full disclosure here. There are some of us in the program that really enjoy research. I am not one of them. So I follow the research that my colleagues do. Instead, um, my uh, research time is uh, my, my clinical job. So I do, I still work uh, and do hospital medicine with the adult hospitalist group at UPMC Susquehanna. And I'm starting a job per diem in the emergency room in two weeks at UPMC Susquehanna. Wow. Okay. So you're busy. Yeah. You know, I, I like to be, I mean, I think all of us in the program have a bit of a type A personality. So right. it's, it's better for uh, the busier I am, the, the better I, I manage time, I think. Sure. No, I got you. You have a regimented lifestyle. No, I got you. Um, well, that's great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, event, again, is going to be outstanding. Uh, should take probably around 35, 40 minutes. Um, we have a presentation uh, that we're going to start here in just a second. Um, feel free to ask questions. If you type it into the Q&A, I can get it to Dr. Grenoble and Dr. O'Brien. Um, this is being recorded. Uh, and for anyone who is catching this on the recording, thank you for joining us too. Um, we'll be posting our contact information at the end if you have any questions to follow up with us afterwards. Um, but with that being said, I will turn it over to uh, you, Dr. Grenoble and Dr. O'Brien, if you want to uh, kick off your presentation. Excellent. Thank you. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here uh, so that uh, all should be able to see the PowerPoint presentation. So, yes, welcome to our, uh, our virtual information session um, regarding the uh, Master of Health Science uh, and Physician Assistant Studies. Uh, so one of the things that I uh, obviously want to point out there is that this is a, a master's level um, uh, degree. Um, so hopefully everybody is uh, anticipating that and uh, expecting that uh, information. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the requirements um, for um, uh, applying to and, and being accepted into the, the, the PA program. Um, and included in that is going to be information about undergraduate degree uh, and prerequisite coursework uh, and, and so on. Um, so tried to go full screen there. Make sure that. Sorry, Chris, if you go, yeah, there you go. Yeah. It, this computer, for some reason, being a little bit delayed here, uh, it's not responding, of course. I'll tell you what, here, let, I'll, uh, 
I'll bring up my presentation here. Let's see. This is how we conduct our interviews for, for those joining us. This is how we conduct our interviews too for the program. So we're used to, you, you know, used to these glitches and trying to uh, trying to figure it out as we go. Yeah, hold on just one second here. All right, let me just share my screen. Stop sharing then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, man. If you go to advanced city, actually, I will just point out here that um, what you see on on this slide is an anatomage uh, table. Um, so that's a virtual um, dissection tool um, that we are going to be uh, uh, utilizing in our anatomy course. Uh, so uh, definitely a lot of focus on on technology. So you can see that screen in front of the uh, the students there and faculty member um, that are uh, you know, examining there. It looks like some vasculature of of the body. So go on to the uh, next slide there. So why why the physician assistant uh, program? Um, uh, the the PA program um, uh, originating at Lock Haven University started in the the mid '90s, um, graduating its first class in in the the late uh, 1990s. Uh, so the program has been around uh, for for a while. It is an established curriculum, and it has been uh, quite successful uh, in in generating. Um, clinicians uh, who who practice throughout the the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and and beyond, um, and so it is a an established program. It is nationally recognized uh, and um, has a, a curriculum that is is well established. And so I think that it is a a very solid choice when you're looking into uh, graduate programs and, and clinical education. Go ahead and go to the next slide there. The um, PA program is uh, 24 months in length, and so uh, it begins in the summer. We actually start in May uh, each year, usually around the third week of May, um, and it goes straight through for two years, 24 months straight through, including summer, fall, and spring semesters. It's designed using the medical model um, of, of approach to, to education, meaning that uh, it follows what medical schools um, largely do. So medical schools have usually two years of didactic classroom and lab-based learning, and then two years of clinical rotations. The PA program is designed basically cutting each of those in half. One year in the classroom, so 12 months of didactic and lab-based learning, and then 12 months of clinical rotations um, for the, uh, the the second year of the program. Um, one of the large benefits of that is you get a, a master's degree with a, a large number of credits, 94 and a half credits uh, is how many credits we have uh, in, in the program. Um, and you do that in a two year time frame. So uh, you're not wasting time, you're getting right through the education uh, and, and getting out there uh, and get, getting a job in a clinical setting. We do follow a modular format to our curriculum for the didactic phase, the, the first year of the program, meaning that we, we um, package the, the curriculum based on organ systems or medical specialties. So we'll have modules like cardiology, pulmonology, nephrology. And then in our last semester, we do some of the medical uh, specialties, things like surgery, emergency medicine, uh, and so on. Um, <clears throat> Our faculty uh, have a, a lot of experience as as PAs as well as uh, physician assistant educators. Uh, so um, between uh, work in healthcare and and work in uh, in academia, um, we have a, a well established um, a faculty. <clears throat> Since they, uh, the first class matriculated uh, in 1996, we've graduated over uh, 800 alumni uh, who are throughout uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and, and beyond uh, across the country as well. Something that's important um, as you are looking into PA programs is going to be pass rates on the national certification exam, which is known as the Physician Assistant National Certifying Examination, um, or PANTS. Um, and uh, our five-year first-time pass rate is 95%, um, and the national average currently sits at 95% uh, as well. well. Go to the next slide. One of the uh, things that you'll want to look into with um, uh, graduate education, PA schools, uh, is going to be your fit at the schools that you are looking into. Um, we look for that too in, in the folks that we are interviewing uh, and admitting into the program. We wanna make sure that your goals match with, with our goals um, for, for the program. And we really have a focus on educating students uh, who will help to serve medically underserved populations. And we're looking at uh, geographic um, locations that might not have access to healthcare, so rural settings, um, but also think of urban settings uh, where there might be a hospital down the road 
road, but the individual doesn't have health insurance to get there. So you have the, the socioeconomic factors, uh, racial and ethnic disparities um, that impact certain populations more than others, corrections medicine, um, an area that sometimes uh, we don't necessarily think about the the, the need for, for health care uh, in, in that patient population uh, as well. And our goal is to really take the graduates from the PA program and get them into those settings to provide that care uh, for those populations who, who lack that care. Uh, we try to build on that concept then as well. Um, both within our curriculum. So we have a course during the fall semester that's called underserved populations where we address historical aspects of healthcare um, and why certain populations may not trust the healthcare system um, or you know, historically the experiences that they've had you know, with, with the healthcare system. We talk about healthcare policy, um, that, you know, where we fall short uh, in providing uh, care for folks. Uh, and then um, the, the social uh, network that we have, you know, what, how can we, how can we try to solve those problems for those populations? And we build on that then by, by outreach. Um, we require students to complete a minimum of three community service events locally, but then we also have uh, international opportunities as well. Um, we have had trips uh, uh, to Jamaica, Costa Rica, uh, and Honduras most recently. Um, in the past, we've also had trips uh, to, to portions of, of Mexico uh, and uh, Morocco um, as some other examples, but currently those three are, are the ones that we have been utilizing most recently. And uh, Dr. Grenoble, when you and your students travel to those areas, what are some of the things that you guys are engaging in? Yeah, so one of the things that we have found is that um, the education is is huge uh, for for some of these populations. So, for example, even oral hygiene, you know, uh, brushing of teeth and, and taking you know good care of teeth, or um, uh, things about diet and exercise to to manage chronic diseases like hypertension and diabetes, because some folks uh, in in these settings won't necessarily have access to or the financial means to access. Uh, insulin or or keep insulin in a in a refrigerator because they don't even have electricity uh, and so education about how they can can manage um, those those diseases um, or prevent those diseases from occurring in the first place we will do some some general health screening as well um, so uh, basic physical exams um, and yeah uh, some some basic um, diagnostics or something that we can take with us um, the challenge there is is if you find something, referring that person because they just may not have access. So our goal is really to um, to utilize <clears throat> the kind of more basic tools that we have available to us, identify risk factors, and help to mitigate uh, the the potential you know um, detrimental effects of of those diseases. So, yeah. okay, thank you. Um, so our, our program is offered um, at multiple campus locations. Uh, again, you see that anatomage table um, that is uh, there at the uh, on the left side of this uh, this slide. Um, we utilize a lot of technology in order to deliver the program uh, across the multiple locations. Uh, so we do not recreate the program at each of those campus locations. Instead, we um, take the same curriculum and deliver it simultaneously across those locations. So I'm uh, based out of the Clearfield campus location. <clears throat> so um, I might have a lecture, uh, for example, tomorrow morning, I have a lecture at 9 a.m. Um, I'll have my lecture from nine to 10. And then uh, I'm giving that lecture real time to all three campus locations. So the Clearfield students are in front of me uh, as I'm delivering that, but I see screens in front of me where the Harrisburg and Lock Haven campuses will be pictured and I'm lecturing to them at the same time. They have microphones at their seats so they can uh, interact with me. They see me right in front of them. They see my computer content. Uh, and if they have a question or a comment, uh, they can push a button on their microphone and it's fully interactive uh, as, as the lecture is being delivered. The next lecture then might be Amber lecturing from Lock Haven. And uh, she would then do the same thing, switch cameras around, uh, and now Amber is lecturing in, in Lock Haven. She's live in front of the Lock Haven crew, and so we're sending that content out to the other campus locations. And so we're utilizing technology continuously to deliver that. Uh, each campus has equivalent um, opportunities, um, so we make sure that that students regardless of what campus they are attending, have the same resources available to them. So we have dedicated classroom, state-of-the-art uh, academic technology. Um, in order to link those together, we have anatomy labs with these anatomage tables at every location, physical exam labs for learning physical exam skills, study space, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so we have equivalent opportunities at all three campus locations. 
Um, our, we do have on-site faculty at each campus as well. So students have an advisor and, and somebody who is directly working with them. They're not sent off to another campus location uh, without you know, faculty um, who are who are there to, to work directly with them. Yeah, go ahead and advance there. So these uh, are our locations um, uh, on this map. So Lock Haven uh, was the original campus location that started in the, in the 90s. We added Clearfield a little bit west of um, of Lock Haven. Clearfield is a, a branch campus uh, of, of Lock Haven. Um, and so a cohort was added then in the early 2000s. Uh, and then somewhere around 2010 or 11, I believe, um, a campus was added at the, the Harrisburg location as well. Uh, current location for uh, the Harrisburg uh, cohort is at the Harrisburg Area Community College, uh, where we have a space um, in, in a facility there in, in at Hack. So as I mentioned, our, we have a 24-month program, May through May. Um, so we start in May, go straight through um, the summer, fall, and uh, spring semester for the didactic phase, the, the classroom and lab-based. Um, and then we have an additional 12 months of clinical rotations um, that uh, are from the second May uh, through through graduation, uh, 24 months uh, out from starting. Um, during the didactic year, as we mentioned, uh, that modular approach, uh, so we take instruction and group it together by organ system or medical specialty. So you don't have, say, an anatomy course running here, a physiology course running over here, a clinical um, medicine course running over here, a pharmacology course. They never stay aligned if you have all these different courses trying to keep their, their curriculum together. You get one that gets a little bit ahead, one that falls behind, uh, and it just gets very disjointed with that kind of approach. By having a modular approach, we package it all together. So within a module, we have lectures on anatomy, we have lectures on physiology, on disease states, diagnostic studies, and so on, all packaged together. We then have an exam on that topic, and we move on to the next module. So it keeps everything uh, combined nicely, packaged nicely, so you're not jumping all over the place between multiple different courses. Each course is delivered over about one to three or four weeks uh, in length uh, in total. So I'm sorry, I had a couple of follow-up questions. So it's 24 months, it's 24 straight months, right? There's no, it's not like a traditional college semester where you've got winter break and then you've got summer break. This is- That's right. The, the, the only breaks that are uh, built in there is, um, the, the break between the uh, the fall and spring semesters, we do follow that, so we don't have anything uh, over the winter kind of intercession time frame, so there's a little bit of a break there. Uh, and then there's uh, maybe two weeks or something like that in August from the end of the, the summer semester uh, to the start of the fall semester. Um, and that's really only for the first year students. By the time you get into the second year of the program, you're out on clinical rotations. Because we're working with our clinical partners, we are kind of following a um, yeah, a schedule that does not rely upon that uh, that academic calendar uh, in order to get the number of weeks and experiences in that we need for students. So that second year is pretty much straight through, except for three weeks from kind of mid December to early January. That's about the only break that the second year students do have there. Okay, and didact didactic. Um, what does that word mean? <laughs> so. <laughs> Didactic refers to a classroom-based delivery. So there's a, sometimes people will use the, the term sage on the stage, right? You have the, the faculty member who's standing up there providing the lecture material, um, kind of your, your, your typical classroom you know, delivery kind of things. Um, now, we do, we do try to make that didactic dialectic as well. Dialectic would mean conversational, right? So we don't want it to constantly be, you know, me standing there talking, you know, and, and you just listening. We do try to make that dialectic and, and, and conversational and, and uh, varied in our, our activities as well. In fact, we do small group activities, usually once a week, where students will meet in a smaller group with a faculty member, do case-based discussions, kind of application of the, uh, of the material that we are, that we are learning. Um, so it's not, solely just sitting in a classroom every single day. Um, we do try to, to have some variety uh, in that as well. But didactic is basically classroom-based um, uh, instruction and lab instruction as well. Okay. And, and we already mentioned there the, the service learning that we try to uh, fold into that as well as the the serve, the uh, local international service um, uh, that we do um, both within our communities as well as you know, uh, abroad. Next one there. In the clinical year, the second year, um, after completing the didactic phase, 
Um, students will then uh, progress on to the clinical year where they complete rotations. There are nine rotations total, three rotations during the summer, three during the fall, and three during the spring, um, five weeks each going May through May again. And we cover various medical specialties and settings. Um, this is uh, partly prescribed by accreditation standards, uh, but then also by program defined um, learning outcomes uh, that we are looking for each student to, to achieve. So students have to have experiences with inpatient medicine, uh, outpatient medicine, surgical settings, emergency medicine, as well as different patient populations such as uh, women's health, pediatrics, um, and so on. And so that is how the design kind of comes into play where we have rotations in pediatrics, internal medicine, surgery, emergency medicine, women's health, family practice, uh, mental and behavioral health, or potentially an elective. Um, Sometimes if somebody doesn't have a particular interest in, in behavioral health, we'll do what we call a mini rotation where they might spend a week or so um, in, uh, in mental behavioral health and then have um, an elective that they do additionally. Uh, and then uh, we do try to get students into an elective where they have you know, particular interest that doesn't necessarily fit um, the, the prescribed uh, rotations there. Uh, Kurt, I'm sorry, we, we've got two quick questions. Um, first one is, how do students get assigned to a specific campus and do they mm -hmm. choose? Very good question. So um, whenever a, a student is offered uh, a seat out uh, within the PA program, we ask them to rank their campus uh, preferences. We ask what's your first and what's your second choice. Um, if there is a seat available at their first choice, uh, they uh, are offered a seat at that location. If there is not a seat available at their first choice, we'll offer them a seat at their second choice and then ask if they want to go on a wait list for their preferred campus location. So if a seat becomes available, we first go to that wait list for that campus location and offer a seat there. Um, once the campus is full, though, we are accredited for a certain number of seats at each campus, 36 seats in Lock Haven and 12 seats each in Clearfield and Harrisburg. We can't go above that. And so um, if we don't have a seat at your preferred campus location, uh, we will make an offer you know, to, at one of the other locations, but give you the chance to go on that wait list. Okay. And um, is part of the didactic learning online? Uh, so we uh, are, are focused primarily with uh, in-person. Um, so uh, during uh, the, the pandemic, obviously, we had to make some adjustments to that. But uh, our focus is a um, an in-person experience. We do have one course during the fall semester that is entirely online. That's our underserved populations course. Um, otherwise, we, we are uh, in-person. We will do some pre-recorded lectures sometimes to um, kind of lighten the schedule or to, to make things kind of work better within our, our schedule schedule, um, but we, we do not have a, a fully online or, or um, our, our, our focus is, is in the, um, the in-person classroom-based and, and lab-based learning. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, go on to the uh, next slide then as well. Uh, so, um, so some outcomes about our, our program, as I mentioned, because we are a state school in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, one of our goals is to have graduates work within Pennsylvania. We have need for healthcare providers uh, here with, within Pennsylvania. And, and so uh, a goal of really um, taking those graduates and putting them into those settings that we talked about previously. So 60% of our, of our graduates um, uh, practicing in, in Pennsylvania, um, about 45% of them practice in, in primary care. And there was an article that was done a few years ago highlighting programs, medical education programs that are successful in, in returning graduates to primary care uh, type of settings. And Lock Haven University's PA program was actually identified as a school that was uh, successful in doing that, um, gaining some national uh, attention for uh, for those rates. Uh, and again, first time pass rate on the, the PANTS, the national certification exam, uh, is 95%. Um, so um, that is important, obviously, because if you complete the program, you want to be able to, to pass that certification exam so that you can work as a, as a physician assistant. That is the first time pass rate students can can take uh, upon graduating, uh, can take the exam uh, multiple times. Um, and so when you look at our overall pass rate, it is, it, it's over 99% uh, who pass it you know, on a second or third attempt if necessary. Um, and one of the things I love about this picture um, is the, the students have a, a sign there say, we want uh, yeah, to, to, yeah, we, we want to, they want to serve the underserved, you know, basically. So these are, um, these are graduates or, or students um, who, are, who are meeting that mission you know, that we have. And Curtis, I'm sorry, a couple more questions. Um, one from Megan. How do exams work at the satellite locations? Will there be support staff there as well? That's a good question. 
Yeah, so for any any exams, uh, we have on-site faculty uh, at each campus location who are, are there to proctor uh, any kind of testing and all that kind of stuff and uh, demonstrate physical exam skills in the labs. So the on-site faculty at each campus location are working directly with the students there, whether it's you know proctoring a, a practical exam, computerized exam, teaching labs, the on-site faculty uh, will do that. So I'm at the Clearfield campus location. We have a, a cohort of 12. Uh, they they know me. They, uh, they know me quite well. I know them quite well. I'm working with them every single day. Uh, and so anytime there's something on campus, um, we have on-site faculty who, who are doing that each campus. Yeah. A uh, question from Tamar, is housing and transportation funded by the university when you are in your rotational year? So uh, we, uh, the housing and, and transportation are not provided by the university. That uh, is the, the student's responsibility. Um, so uh, we do require that uh, students have reliable transportation uh, to get to and from uh, clinical sites, uh, as well as the, the, the program uh, during the first year. Uh, and then um, also uh, the, the housing uh, is the, the student's responsibility. We will uh, before we do clinical placements, uh, we interact with uh, each student. So we, we send out what we call a wish list where students can identify geographic locations uh, where they might be interested uh, in um, in in doing their rotations where they might have opportunities for housing and that sort of thing, as well as um, uh, medical disciplines uh, that they are interested in. So we try to match them up with the their areas geographically of interest as well as their their disciplines of interest um, but it will require some travel um, as well um, and so students will usually uh, utilize some short-term housing uh, opportunities and we do have a spreadsheet um, of uh, locations that students have used in the past that current students can utilize to help identify housing opportunities and curtis so for students who attend the lock haven campus or the clearfield campus are they able to live on campus should they choose in like a university owned apartment complex so there are uh, opportunities to to live um in in uh, university either it's typically actually foundation owned uh, properties that the um the uh, pa students would choose to live in because they're typically more of the uh, apartment style um kind of housing um and so in in clearfield we do have a facility that is owned by the lock haven university foundation that is across the parking lot uh, from the um the classroom um and then uh, similarly in in lock haven there's a foundation owned facility there too uh that uh, that students can live in many times students will will choose to to get private you know apartments in, in town and that sort of thing as well okay. but we make a list available um, of of housing options at, at all three uh, campus locations so that students mm -hmm. have some guidance uh, when when making some some decisions regarding housing yeah. great thanks and then um, does this program offer any accommodations for people with learning disabilities so we do um, work closely with the um, what is known uh, at at the, uh, the Lock Haven campus as the office uh, of uh, disability Services for Students, ODSS, um, and uh, students who are granted accommodations through the Office of D Disability Services for Students, um, we uh, do all we can to to accommodate uh, those uh, those needs the student might have. Some of the more commonly used um, um, are have to do with testing, so extended testing time or um, re distraction reduced testing environment. Um, but we've had some some students who have had some physical disabilities as well who have needed some accommodations, um, which uh, we've been able to work through with our, our preceptors as well. Uh, so we had a, a student who had uh, been in a car accident and um, had accommodations uh, because she was unable to stand for uh, extended periods of time, and um, we were able to get through her through surgery rotations and, and all of those. Um, and she's practicing as a as a PA successfully today. So yes, we we do work with our uh, disability services to make those uh, accommodations available. Great, thank you. So career options, uh, you'll find PAs working anywhere there's a physician, basically. So primary care settings, family practice, internal, women's health, pediatrics, emergency medicine, uh, urgent care kind of settings, and then medical and surgical specialties and, and subspecialties. So anywhere from general surgery to uh, surgical you know, uh, specialties, such as orthopedics and cardio cardiothoracic surgery, or in internal medicine uh, specialties like cardiology, pulmonology, hospital medicine, uh, and so on. So uh, pretty much anywhere there's a, a physician, PAs can be found in those locations. So Curtis, one of my questions, um, and there might be people in the audience wondering the same thing, the difference between, I, I guess, the clinical um, experiences between maybe a nurse, a doctor, and a PA. How do people who maybe have an interest in one of those two, because honestly, if you were inter interested in being a nurse, you might also be interested in being a doctor or being a, a PA. And Amber, I think you had mentioned earlier that you were a nurse at one point, and then you transitioned into a, a PA career. How 
if for, for those people who are maybe wondering how, like, is it, what are what are some of the um, differences among the, the career outcomes? Curtis, do you want me to take that question? Sure. You've been you've been taking doing the majority of the work here. So, <laughs> um, so first of all, um, to to uh, advanced practice practitioners um, are considered uh, midwives, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. So, um, and and nurse anesthetist as well. But in order to go it, to be a nurse practitioner or a nurse anesthetist, you have to have your undergraduate degree in nursing. So you have to have a bachelor's of science in nursing. So that's um, that kind of helps differentiate right there. Um, and with a physician assistant, um, you obviously can have a bachelor's in a variety of different undergraduate degrees, um, as long as you meet the prerequisites for whatever PA program you're applying to. <laughs> Um, now, as far as a physician, uh, the, the schooling's a lot longer. Um, you know, most most uh, physicians go to undergrad for four years, med school for four years, and then do a residency for four years. So we're talking at least a 12-year um, education process for physicians, and that's not including those physicians that go on to do a fellowship, which, which can be three to four years. Mm -hmm. So the schooling is a lot a lot longer for a physician, um, but uh, as far as nurse practitioners and PAs, they are two of the biggest differences. It's um, the the what you choose as far as your undergraduate degree, and then what your options are for your you know your master's program. As far as working clinically, um, we we currently um, physician assistants have gained a uh, optimal team practice, which has given us more autonomy. Um, as far as not being completely obligated to one supervising physician, for that reason, we're able to work more similarly to what a nurse practitioner does. Okay. Yeah, that, that's helpful. I mean, honestly, like, I feel like, you know, our primary care doctor is a PA, you know, I, I feel like I see that happening more often now. I would imagine it's one of the things we'll talk about when we get to the job outlook slide. Um, which I think is coming up next is just is the demand and how healthcare is changing and how um, the uh, PAs are becoming a more prominent part of healthcare and in, in, in clinical situations. So Amber, you were a nurse um, and then switched to um, the a role as a PA. So what went into your decision to to switch roles? So interesting background. Me and my two my two sisters are all nurses. We all got our oh. bachelor's of science in nursing. Um, my myself and my uh, second oldest sister went to Misericordia. Um, my little sister went to Bloom, uh, Bloomsburg University for nursing. They both, they both are nurse practitioners. My brother and I are both physician assistants. Um, yeah. And my, my sister and my brother run a family practice office in the Lock Haven area together. So you're saying it's the family business. Okay. I mean, yeah, the conversations are pretty interesting. We all know which one of the two um, is a better option, but if you talk to them, I'm sure they they disagree with me. Right, but yeah. um, anyway, so yeah, I I, I was uh, had my bachelor's of science in nursing. I was working at Hershey Medical Center doing inpatient trauma, and I decided that I wanted to be a more primary uh, care provider for the patients that I was seeing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to do more. I looked at both a nurse practitioner and a physician assistant, and at the time I was applying, that was in 2005. Um, the physician assistants worked more, were found to be hired more in an inpatient setting, whereas nurse practitioners were hired more in family practice, pediatric and women's health, mm -hmm. which personally, I knew I was not interested in that. I knew that I liked the inpatient setting. Now today, I have to be honest with you in our hospitalist group, we probably have an equal number of nurse practitioners and PAs working within the group. So Mm -hmm. Times are different now, but at that time, the PA route, as far as job opportunities, was a better fit for me. Okay, good to know. Thanks. So on this slide, you can see some um, some examples of where our uh, recent graduates uh, are 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 working. Some of the 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 settings that they are working in. So um, as you can see, as we mentioned previously on the the previous slide, can pretty much work in any medical discipline, um, and whether from primary care to, to specialty settings. So cardiology, sleep medicine. Um, there is a surgery uh, fellowship that is uh, at the Yale New Haven uh, Hospital that a number of our graduates uh, and some of our faculty uh, have actually gone through, um, which is a great 
great opportunity if you know that you're really interested in a, in a surgical setting and you really want to have this immersive experience. It's not required for PAs to go through a fellowship or a residency program, um, but it will give you a really deep understanding and some uh, really immersive experience in, uh, in, in a certain discipline. So surgery is one of those that has um, these opportunities. There are other um, specialties as well. Um, we have graduates in infectious disease, family practice, psychiatry, uh, the list goes on certainly from there, um, uh, from pretty much any medical specialty. Job outlook, it's it's very solid. Um, so if you look at the uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics um, Occupational Outlook Handbook, so uh, this is where they look at all kind of uh, um, different uh, areas of employment uh, and and try to estimate what the need is going to be out for, for a decade. Um, PAs are expected to grow much faster than average for all professions from 2021 to 2031 at about 28% growth. Um, so that uh, leads to about 12,700 openings for new PAs each year. Uh, so the demand is there. Uh, and as we have an aging uh, workforce as well, um, we're going to have uh, ongoing need uh, for more PAs and we have an aging population uh, that needs to be taken care of. Um, we're we're going to see that demand sustained for, for the foreseeable future. On there. Amber, are you taking the application in admission process? I am, yes. So I'm going to cover a little bit about the admission process um, with our program. So students apply online through CASPA, which stands for the Centralized Application Service for Physician Assistants. And then those applications come in. The application cycle runs from April uh, through October. And these are the students that we're looking at to be accepted the following year, the following May. Um, and we do review um, any student's application that meets the criteria, and then the faculty decide on which applicants we'd like to interview from that point. We do hold about eight interview sessions a year, um, and uh, they, they run from August through November. So we actually just finished our interview cycle for this upcoming May. College transcripts, our minimum overall GPA, as well as our minimum science GPA is a 3.0. And then we, we definitely look for um, the applicant to have satisfactory completion of our prerequisite courses, which we'll talk about in the upcoming slides. So these are our prerequisite courses. Um, students have to have general chemistry one, general, general chemistry two, two biology or zoology courses, human anatomy, and human physiology, and these can be a combined two semester course of ANP one and two. Microbiology, genetics, statistics, and orga organic chemistry. Now, one more thing about this slide is anatomy and physiology, as well as microbiology, have to be completed within five years of matriculation in the program. And we do have, we, we didn't just make that difficult, for applicants that may be out of school for a, a longer period of time and then decide to apply. There is a reason behind that. Um, our, our anatomy course and our infectious disease course occurs in that first semester of the program. They are very intense courses. And those, are the, that, those two courses are the courses that we see students struggle in the most. So we wanna make sure they have that content most recently. Um, Amber, we have some questions for you about the admission process. Um, so Tamar had asked, what's the format of the interviews? Is it in person? Is it one-on-one -on -one, or is it virtual? So it's virtual. Um, we started the virtual interviews um, you know, a couple of years ago when COVID had, had hit the, the world. And we wanted to continue. There was a huge need for medical providers. We wanted to continue the interview process. Obviously, we couldn't do it in person. So we do um, virtual interviews. Uh, we have two sessions each day. One lasts from eight to 12. The other one is one to five. Um, and we start off by doing an introduction, which Curtis and I um, usually typically tag team to do those introductions. And then we do the interviews one-to-one -one with the students. So we use a breakout room feature where two faculty members will interview the applicant um, without any of the other applicants involved. So we do we do kind of, we do virtual, we do a group format, and then we do the individual interviews in a breakout, um, more individual format. 
Okay. Uh, what classes would be considered biology or, zo or zoology courses? So most of the time, general biology are the most common courses that we see. Um, I, I am trying to think offhand of some of the other biology courses that we take. Now, some of the students take higher level bio, biology courses, you know, biology 300, 400 level course, and that would count for those two biology requirements also. Mm -hmm. But the two most common ones are general bio one and two. I was throwing there as well. Sometimes um, some schools don't have like bio one, bio two, or intro to bio one and two. And um, some examples there would be like cellular biology, um, things that are going to be basic biology concepts um, are, are what our, our focus would be there to kind of lay that foundation of concepts. Um, is sometimes some of the higher level science courses can become so specialized in one area that you don't get a good foundation of concepts. Um, and so a course that kind of is um, more general in its approach to biology would be a, a, the, the goal there. Okay. Um, what are your options if you do not get accepted into the graduate program right away? So um, what, we, what we offer to students is if they do not get accepted, we encourage those students to reach out to us for feedback for why they didn't get accepted. And there are a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes the, the prerequisites are outstanding and we want to make sure they re they complete those prerequisites with their beer a beer better which i should mention all of these courses do have to be completed with a b or better in order to meet the prerequisite cri criteria um another reason may be maybe we feel they need um some some more exposure some some maturity um mm -hmm. with exposure in the healthcare setting okay. another reason may be interpersonal functioning interviewing skills. Um, so, and it's just a matter of, of practice um, and, and feedback regarding how they can do better during that interview and practice over that year to come back the following year and apply. So there are a variety of reasons students may not get accepted. Um, and we do offer the opportunity for students to individually contact who interviewed them for feedback on how to strengthen it for the following year. There are, in addition, a lot of programs for students who either choose to take a gap year or have not gotten accepted and um, ha have that gap year. There are a variety of programs. I know, for instance, I just met with Temple University who has one, and they focus on helping students maybe take the prerequisite courses that they, they needed over again, or taking some higher level science courses that will increase that GPA and give, her, give them a better chance of getting into the program. Okay. Um, how many credits are required for organic chem? Three, three, three credits. Okay. Um, are community college credits accepted? As long as it's approved by the accrediting body of the United States, we accept um, any any of the the courses. Okay. And again, um, if do sorry, Tom. If there are any no, questions ahead. regarding that. Uh, we get a lot of uh, emails from students saying, hey, I'm looking into this program to take this course. Is this an approved uh, university? And we're able to give them that information if, if they aren't able to find it. Okay. Um, do any of the courses require a lab component? So we prefer labs, but they are not required. Okay. Um, how many PCE hours are required for admission into the program? Uh, patient care? Patient care experience? Um, I think, yeah, PC, yeah, I think a lot of programs do uh, abbreviate that patient care experience, yeah. Yeah, so actually, um, we do not require a minimum amount of patient care experience to apply to our program. Um, the reason for that is, like Curtis mentioned, we are a huge mission-based uh, mission program. So we know that we're encouraging students from underserved areas uh, to apply to the program. And sometimes it's very difficult for those students to get access to shadow or to uh, a paid opportunity for patient care experience. With that said, um, we do, most of our applicants uh, do have about 40 hours on average of patient care experience, whether that be paid experience or shadowing with a physician assistant. Okay. 
Um, can we still apply if we have a couple of prerequisite courses pending or still outstanding as long as they are completed by the start of the program? That is a very good question. It's a very good question. So yes, the, the short answer to that is yes. Yes, you can. Now, we do not allow more than three outstanding prerequisites um, during at the time of interview. So the reason for that is because um, we, we're taking a chance on those students who haven't completed those prerequisites yet. We're assuming they're gonna get that B or better. And we, we have decided as a faculty that it's, it's just, um, it's too big of a chance to allow more than three outstanding prerequisites and accept that, that student into the program in that upcoming year. So yes, we do allow three outstanding prerequisites um, at the time of interview. And then we just reinforce the fact during the interview with that applicant that if they do get accepted, they do have to complete those courses with a B or better. Okay. Um, my undergrad program currently only offers mammalian anatomy. Would this be accepted? It would be accepted, yes. Um, are dissection labs for the didactic year only virtual? I meant to ask this earlier. That's a good question. Yes, great question for that too. So um, I personally am really excited about uh, these anatomage tables. We just got them. Um, and they are an incredible experience as far as very similar to a real cadaver. Now, what we did this past year, and I'm hoping that we can still do this in the future, is we had two cadavers at the Lock Haven campus. And we had an undergraduate faculty member, um, Dr. Mike Porter, do prosections on the body. And then the students came week five of their summer session and reviewed all of the musculoskeletal system of that prosected body with Dr. Porter. It, it lasted about two hours and he, he guided them and quizzed them on the structures. And then in week 10 of the semester, the students came back to the prosected body and reviewed the organs that Dr. Porter had prosected in the last half of the summer session. So we utilized an online feature um, which was not, not an anatomage last year. We will be using that starting this upcoming May, as well as a prosected cadaver. Okay. Um, I understand that there is no minimum requirement for patient care hours, but what is your opinion on caregiving hours? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Obviously, I was a nurse when I applied to the program. So mm -hmm. I, um, I did have that, that patient care experience. And it is hugely beneficial. I mean, as far as just comfort level of doing things that we do within the first week, like vital signs, communication with a patient and comfort of walking into a patient's room. I, I do think it's very important um, if you have the ability to gain some experience prior to coming to PA school. But again, we understand that that's not possible for every applicant. Uh, great questions, please. Keep them coming. These are these are phenomenal. Yes. Are you ready to go to the next slide, Dr. O'Brien? Yes. Yes. Sure. Okay. So the the courses I mentioned on the previous slide are our prerequisite courses. You must have them with a B or better um, before matriculation into the program. These are some courses that we that would strengthen your application. That would show the faculty that you can go through a, a rigorous program like those twenty four months of a physician assistant program. Some of those advanced courses again. These are not required, but recommended. Um, those higher level biology courses. One of the most recent um, uh, courses that I've seen taken by a large majority of students is immunology. And it does, it is hugely beneficial um, as far as, as, as our PA program, especially during that first semester. Uh, higher level science uh, chemistry courses, physics one and two, and then advanced courses in psychology and anatomy and physiology. Encouraged activities. And again, you, you guys were ahead of the game on this by asking those questions. Some encouraged but not required activities, shadowing with a physician assistant. Um, and again, a couple of years ago, it was very hard for students to get in-person shadowing hours. So we have, we did in the past see virtual shadowing, which we had to ask the students about that because that was a whole kind of 
learning curve for us as far as how, how that went. Most recently, students have been able to get more shadowing hours, those that have the opportunity to do so. Patient care experience, things that qualify, certified nursing assistant, EMT, uh, we do see some paramedics, phlebotomy. So anything that gives you direct patient care um, would qualify as patient care experience. Service and volunteerism. We look for students. Um, so we, we don't necessarily look for that student that has a 4.0 um, and has not really had a holistic pro approach to their undergraduate program. We look for students. Yes, you have to meet those prerequisite requirements, but we look for students that engaged in service opportunities in their community or maybe domestically or maybe did mission trips abroad. So we, we do kind of um, uh, give a little bit of extra credit for those students that do those, those additional things um, outside of the classroom. Underserved exposure, Curtis already touched on this. Um, our mission is to bring students from underserved areas and place them back in clinical practice in those areas. And then students that are involved in research during their undergraduate or during um, you know, their, their gap year or postgraduate studies. Um, Amber, shadowing with, with NPs and MDs good as well? So that's a great question, Tom. Um, we strongly encourage it to be a PA because that's the only way they truly know what a PA does is by directly shadowing them. Um, you know, if a student comes in and has shadowed a nurse practitioner or a physician and that's their only shadowing, we may ask them, what did you learn? You know, what, what kind of, of shadowing experience was that? And if, if, if it's a quality experience, well, then of course, we'll recognize that as well. But again, you know, directly shadowing a PA is really how a student sees what we do every day in our clinical work. Okay, great, thank you. Some demographics here. Um, I, I think, I mean, I, I reviewed this PowerPoint a few times and I can't see the exact numbers right now, but our average total GPA is about a 3.5. Is that correct on there, guys? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So this is really exciting news um, for those of you that are considering applying in the future. We no longer will be requiring the GREs. So those numbers aren't really important for you um, as you prep to apply to our pre pre PA program. So really exciting, starting with this upcoming class, the cycle that will open in April, we will no longer require the GREs. Instead, we replaced that standard with organic chemistry, which is now a requirement. The median age, does that say 24? 22. 22. Okay, I was doing so well. Um, so the median age is about 22 um, in our program, and the age range in the class that just graduated, class of 2022, uh, was anywhere from 20 to 38 years old when they started the program, so at the time of matriculation. Um, as far as acceptance goes, about 68% of our students in the class of 2022 were from Pennsylvania, about 32% were from out of state. And we do get applicants and we do get students who join the program from different states every year. So if you are from another state applying to the program, you will not be the only one in the program outside of Pennsylvania. Gender, you can see here a little bit higher predisposition for uh, females compared to males. Um, and I would bet to say this is probably similar to what the national percentage is with uh, PA programs. Ooh. No, that's okay. Okay. That's good. And then this is our contact information. Again, you can feel free to reach out to us at any time. Uh, if, you, if you didn't think of any questions, during this session, and in a couple of days you do, feel free to reach out to us. We're very familiar with students um, with, with questions, especially when they're prepare, preparing to, to apply and during the application cycle. Okay, I know we have some questions here. I'm just gonna go ahead and, and stop my share. Um, and in case it wasn't obvious, uh, the, the Lock Haven mascot is a, a uh, bald eagle. 
I think there's a there's an eagle in some form um, on just about every single slide there. Um, so uh, continuing with, with, with the questions here, uh, when would you recommend shadowing a PA? Um, I'm asking because I'm currently a freshman year of undergraduate. Anytime. Anytime you have the opportunity to shadow, I think you take advantage of it. One of the times that I see uh, folks taking advantage of is, the, is their summer break or a, a break mm -hmm. in between semesters, um, just because you're not having to fit that in with your uh, your academics uh, in, in that case, and you can get a dedicated, you know, a few weeks or something like that that you would spend with somebody. But yeah, I, I wouldn't wait um, because it can't, it might take a little while to set up an experience because you have to go through education offices and uh, and, and get paperwork and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, as you have the opportunity to start, start pursuing, um, you know, options um, and yeah, anything, you know, from uh, from now until your time of application would, would be great. Okay. Um, would taking the GRE, although it's not required, still strengthen your application? You know, um, that's a great question. And I think we, uh, as, a, as a group, I think we would definitely um, gives credits for the, give credit to those students who have taken the GRE. Now, again, um, taking the GRE and scoring a 250 on it is not a great score. So um, we would have to look at the scoring. Our, our previous standard for the GREs was a combined score of 300 with a writing score of 3.5. So for the, the uh, student on that asked that question, that'll give you kind of a standard of what we were looking for in the past as far as our minimum requirement. We do like to be holistic in our evaluation. And so if you have something that you have done, um, yeah, if you took the MCATs and then you decided, you know, I'm not going to go to medical school, but I, you know, I worked hard you know, to, to do MCAT scores can be included, you know, even though we don't require, you know, MCAT scores, uh, GRE scores, anything mm -hmm. that you've done that you're like, you know, this, this helps to demonstrate who I am and the work I've done and my, my qualifications. Uh, we like to be holistic uh, in that review. Um, is the science GPA taken into consideration? Yep. So our minimum requirement is an overall GPA of 3.0 and a science GPA of 3.0. So that is our minimum requirement for both overall and science. And some recent uh, research has actually shown um, science GPA to be um, closely correlated to success uh, in, in PA programs. And so it does receive uh, its own focus um, as we review um, applications. That's going to be among the best predictors, I would imagine, for success in the program. Yep. Yep. Um, how would you go about shadowing? How do you get it approved? So that really, um, so there are a variety of ways students go about. Sometimes they they know somebody uh, individually. They have a personal connection or they know somebody who knows somebody and they try to reach out to try to get some shadowing hours. Another option would be if it's a, a larger organization, reach out to the coordinator. They always have a student coordinator in these larger organizations. Reach out via email. Sometimes you have to do it multiple times. It's not, don't afraid to be annoying with those things. Um, but don't don't tell the student coordinator I said that. Um, but sometimes you do have to kind of bug, that, bug them over and over again. But that's another way to meet some of those shadowing hours is just to do a general email to the student coordinator and say, hey, listen, um, I want to apply to, to PA school and I'm looking for some shadowing hours. Sometimes, uh, you know, wherever you go for a provider, if they have, you know, PAs there, um, you know, see if you can 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 talk with them. Um, the uh, the education offices at, at larger uh, facilities, though, are going to be um, kind of where you need to start in, in those bigger facilities. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm currently a junior at Lock Haven and taking intro to organic chemistry. I plan to graduate in May 2024. Will I have to take organic chemistry one along with that? No. Intro to organic chemistry will meet our organic chemistry requirement. Um, if we have a course we would like to have reviewed to be sure it would be counted as a prerequisite, can we reach out to one of you or who do we reach out to if not? You can reach out to, to any of us. Yes, we do that all the time. I would recommend Dr. Grenoble or Dr. O'Brien and probably not me as much. I don't know that, that my input is going to have as, as much value. Um, is there any preference given to current Lock Haven students in the application review process? So if you're a current Lock Haven student, um, then what we do is if you meet the prerequisite requirement, you have a guaranteed interview. Okay. That is not a guaranteed acceptance, but if you do meet the requirements that, that we just spoke about, then you, we do offer an interview. 
Would that be guaranteed um, as well for Bloomsburg and Mansfield students? So um, Curtis probably could uh, could vouch for this. I think we probably would extend that to those campus to those universities as well. Um, my PA will let me. I was just unsure if there was anything I needed to do through the campus. So I think her um, cycling back to basically how would um, a student identify the job shadowing? Does any of that shadowing need to be um, um, verified? Or, yeah, yeah we, verified. We, right. Yeah. We do not require any kind of verification. We go kind of an honor system, you know, for for those okay. shadowing experiences. Um, do know that CASPA does monitor things, and that, and if they see irregularities, they will actually basically kick a person's application out. So so please be honest, you know, about the experiences that you do have. Um, but we do not require any kind of approval in advance. We don't require documentation or, or anything like that. You simply document it in your CASPA application. Um, so uh, no need to get it pre-approved. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, if I have a master's degree, will my graduate school GPA be factored into the overall GPA? Good question. Yes, and CASPA does all of our all of our um, verification of application and GPA. So they they do kind of, they kind of do that work for us, and then they submit it to us once it's verified. Another thing I'll throw into that as well is that CASPA does an overall GPA calculation. They do a per semester GPA calculation or, or say um, uh, per year, I guess I should say. So like freshman, sophomore, junior, um, and then they do post baccalaureate um, and, and so on. And one of the things that we will look for as well is, is trends. So, you know, say somebody struggled their freshman year uh, and they you know, dug a little bit of a, of, a, of a hole for themselves, but they really, you know, progressed through and then they showed evidence that as they took some of those additional, you know, higher level science courses and maybe even went into a master's degree, they really demonstrated that who I was my freshman year is not who I am today. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we look at that, um, um, chronological progression, you know, of, uh, of GPA and, and coursework and such as well. Um, how many applications do you get each cycle? Yeah, so great question. We get about five applicants each cycle. Um, and then we interview about 200 applicants. And that's, that's kind of just a, a solid number to remember, give or takes, uh, to give or take a few. But over the last couple of years, that's been the consistent numbers. So did you say that you interviewed 200? Yeah, for 60 seats. Okay. Yeah, these are outstanding questions. I think I started this by saying, I think we might go 30 or 35 minutes at uh, clocking in at a solid hour here. Yeah, um, I mean, if you get- any additional questions? Those students are, they don't even have to come to the interview if they get an interview. I mean, this is basically what we do for the first hour. It's all the yeah. questions <laughs> that they asked. Yeah, this is great. So I will take that silence as a no additional questions. And again, honestly, if, oops, sorry, one more. Um, what do you do if you do not get a seat? So we, we encourage you to uh, reach out for feedback regarding why you were not offered a seat. And then we encourage you to take that feedback and reapply the following year. Okay. Um, and is it 60 seats across all campuses? 36 seats in Lock Haven. 12 seats in Harrisburg and 12 seats in Clearfield with each cohort. Okay, yes, and a thank you to you too, Rieta. Just a, a kind thank you. So thank you to you as, as well for joining us. Um, and again, this was excellent. Really appreciate all the questions. Um, this does not need to be the end of the discussion though. So it, it, this could be the, the beginning. Um, I am graduating with my first degree, but took my first courses years before. I have some courses transferred, but not all. Do I need to supply all transcripts? Yes, all transcripts for verification. And that's, that's another thing that CASPA is on the lookout for. So if they see that you have credit from a previous institution that you got credit for toward your, your undergraduate degree, they will flag it if it doesn't, if you don't also have the transcripts from your previous institution. And so they, um, they will be uh, making sure that there are uh, all transcripts are, are included. Yeah. So again, th this can be the beginning of the discussion, okay? So if, if anyone wants to continue the discussion or has some additional questions or um, wants to stay in contact, we would love to hear from you. Um, you know, feel free to follow up with, with any of us here on the call tonight. Um, we certainly look forward to hearing from everybody in the future uh, and hope everybody has a great night. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye everybody.